If you're worshiping with us online today, make sure you have your communion supplies ready for that special time toward the end of our service. Please remember to submit your attendance to us each week. All you have to do is click the link in the pinned comments or the link that is in the video description if you are watching online. Or if you are here in person, there is a plaque in front of you on the pew that's in front of you that has a little QR code. All you have to do is pull the camera out on your phone, scan that QR code, and then select the appropriate form for you to fill out. But you can also access the bulletins and our online giving through that link. If you cannot get it to work, all you have to do is go to FCCPlano.org slash info. Today after the service, we'll have a short congregational meeting to vote on changes to our bylaws, so be sure and hang around after the service is over. Oh, precious is the flow. Their mission is to deal specifically with children who have suffered the loss of a loved one. Someone, you have an opportunity to come and help out. You can provide supplies. You can provide a meal or you could provide your time and go through training. I would encourage you that if you have any questions, reach out to me because I'm involved, or you can call the numbers that have been imposed upon this while we've been talking about it. Reach out and help someone. Nothing but the blood of Hi guys, my name is Jordan Palmer and I'm from the Outreach Committee. The Outreach Ministry team is collecting new men's and women's socks and underwear in August. Items needed are men's and women's socks and underwear of all sizes. We will also accept women's sports bras. There will be a donation box in the narthex beginning the first Sunday in August through the last Sunday in August. On the last Sunday of August, we will be sorting out items. If you would like to help, please contact me to get more info. We appreciate your donations. Along with giving online, we also have these offering boxes in the narthex. Good morning to the church. Welcome and uh, those of you who are worshiping with us online and those of you who are with us in the sanctuary, we're glad to see everyone today. I encourage you to check in using the QR code or the link tree with a membership if you're a member or visitor if you're a visitor today. And if you'd like to check in on the comment section, we have a hashtag every week. So today's hashtag is hashtag front row. Hashtag front row, and hopefully you'll see the significance of that a little bit later. So thank you for joining us today. Now let's prepare our hearts as we go into a time of worship. Good morning. If you uh, noticed, there's no one behind me today. Uh, <laughs> Michelle is absolutely fine. Uh, I, some of you may or may not have heard over the weekend, we, uh, McKinney Repertory Theater, was supposed to have done our final weekend of shows and tragically we had to cancel because three of our cast members and one of our crew members tested positive uh, with COVID. So in, in light of that, many of us got tested, myself included, uh, a few days ago and I tested negative. So Michelle is still waiting for the results of her test. So she wanted to be on the safe side and, and not risk exposing if for any reason she, she had it. but. Uh, she wanted me to send her her regrets, and uh, and she's very sorry that, that she couldn't be here to worship with us this morning. So, uh, since you all drew the short straw, I'm going to be playing guitar on the hymns, <laughs> and we will uh, and we will sing the responses uh, a cappella, and I will give you a starting note just to be fair. So, <laughs> Charles Wesley said, and it's in it's it's in all kinds of documents. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, if you can't sing good, sing loud. <laughs> so I expect all of you to do both today and, and help me out. So thank you. And now let us prepare for the call to worship. Please stand as you are able and join me for today's call to worship. Praise the Lord. Great are God's works. Gracious and merciful is the Lord. The Lord's name is holy and awesome. So let's lift our voices to praise the Lord our God. Seems like you knew this was going to happen. That's good that you kept thinking about that. Thanks for that. Uh, first hymn is going to be number 16, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Uh, we're going to sing verses 1 through 3. If 
you'll notice, I know this looks contemporary, but I am wearing a robe, so we're traditional. <laughs> This morning, I share with you these words of Soren Kierkegaard as we come before God in prayer. Holy Spirit, you make alive. Bless also this our gathering, the speaker and the hearer. Fresh from the heart it shall come by your aid. Let it also go to the heart. Father in heaven, when the thought of you wakes in our hearts, let it not wake like a frightened bird that flies about in dismay but like a child waking from its sleep with a heavenly smile. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The children are now dismissed to make their way to the back of the church to go to worship and wonder. As they are heading that way, I wanted to let all of you know that they will be talking about the story of Jesus calming the storm, which can be found in Mark 4 and Luke and Matthew 8. The miraculous story when Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves and the storm disappears. After church, when you see your child again, I encourage you to ask them the following question. If Jesus can calm the weather, what can he do for us? It's wonderful to be surrounded by people who are so talented that they can just wing it and it comes off quite well. <laughs> Do you ever stop to reflect on the generosity of the people in your life, the people that you know personally? Do you enjoy reading articles about the generosity of people that you don't know, but people who give willingly so much of their time and so much of their money? Well, in some of my reflections, I came across this short story. In a faraway land, the people received a decree from their king. 
The decree was three simple words, giving is forbidden. At first, when people saw the decree, they rejoiced. A great burden, many said, had been lifted from their shoulders, and they would now have more time, money, and resources for themselves. But then it happened that a young boy picked some flowers for his mother, but she was forbidden to accept them. And a motorist ready to pull off to the side of the road to help a stranded traveler was reminded that giving was forbidden. It wasn't long before people noticed that the decree had not increased happiness, but had lessened it. They sent a delegation to the king to say, we understand that you intended to lift a burden of giving, but we have discovered that giving is not a burden at all. Take back your decree and allow us to give once again. And so like the people in that faraway land, we are reminded that giving, whether time or money, is not a burden. For our giving simply demonstrates the way we have given ourselves to God and to others. Our giving is not a fundraising ritual, but truly an act of worship. Remember the words from Matthew 6:21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as you present your tithes and your offerings on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, do so with a joyful heart. Let's stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Would you pray with me? Most gracious and loving Father, we pray that the gifts we offer today truly reflect our love and thanksgiving for the many blessings that you have entrusted to our care. We are thankful for the opportunity to give. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. It's a little different without the uh, organ behind us, isn't it? Anybody here grow up in an a cappella tradition in worship? That sounds a little normal to you, yeah? Um, but most of us, if you've spent your time in a church that had a company, that, that's it's really different, right? And one of the main differences is you can hear yourself. Sometimes the accompaniment's loud enough to where you just all sort of blends together, right? But you can, hear, you can hear yourself. And it would be a lot harder if we said, okay, we don't have an accompanist today, so Gary Turk, you're going to sing a solo. Okay, no, no, we, we don't necessarily, oh, here he is. <laughs> if you had to sing all by yourself, that would be much harder, wouldn't it? But just the fact that you can hear yourself, you can also hear everybody else around you. Stacy and I uh, worshiped one time in a friend of mine's congregation at Church of Christ, and uh, they are a cappella, and boy, we could really hear all the harmonies. And I mean, really strongly hear all parts of the harmonies. And I finally looked around and realized, oh, what they've done is they have microphones out in the congregation. And so they have different people assigned to sing each harmony so that everybody can find their part and sing it together. It was really, really special when it's just the voice of the people. Because the truth is, Aaron's job is not to sing for us. Aaron's job is to get us to sing, is to provide us ways to praise God. God wants to hear your voice, even if you don't think it's good. God wants to hear your voice and your heart and your mind and your spirit praise. Did you find anything else different? Do you pay attention to the words a little bit more when, when you're responsible for making the music? I found that I did, even though those are songs that I've already sung many times. And it struck me again, come thou fount of every blessing, the part that says, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. A fetter is like a shackle, right? 
on your leg or something. And so what is it that binds us to God even though our hearts wander? It's because God is so good. We just want to keep coming back again and again. As much as we might be tempted by sin, what tempts us even more and reminds us, like a shackle almost, is that God is so good. So why would we ever want anything else? So as we go to the Lord in prayer today, I think prayer sounds to God the same way that that music does. God wants to hear all the voices. So remember, as you pray today, you're not the only person praying. There is a chorus of prayer, and it all is somehow exponentially multiplied because we're all praying together, and it all makes sense to God as God listens to it. So add your voice and your heart and your spirit to the prayer today as we go into this time. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you want to hear each of your creatures praise you. You also command us to bring to you our needs, to bring to you our concerns and our fears and our questions, as well as our joys and our praise and our thanksgiving. And so now in this time, we each add our heart to this chorus of prayer together. And now we pray together as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, If one of you had a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, Will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Let's pray as we open God's Word. Lord, thank you today for the chance again to be together in your presence. And as we come to your Word, we ask that you make us ready to listen. Shine the light in the areas in our lives that need it and help us to accept it with gratitude and grace. We ask it in your name. Amen. Well, last week in the Gospel of Luke, some Pharisees came to Jesus to warn him about a threat from King Herod. This week we find him in the company of another Pharisee and, as more often happened, a controversy ensues. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. The Pharisees just can't stand stand to stay away from Jesus, can they? As we saw last week, it might be because some of them are actually starting to listen to him. But this week, with this Pharisee, it seems a little different. Luke tells us that this time, Jesus is being carefully watched. So not only are they on the lookout for Jesus to do something that they can attack him for, as we'll see, they may have even set up the situation intentionally to test Jesus. This whole section, and next week's passage as well, take place in the context of a banquet. Jesus is sitting at a banquet the entire time. He talks about banquets and even creates a parable about a banquet. So it's important that we know what banquets were like in first century Israel. A banquet was almost always a time for showing off. It was about showing off your wealth, your house, your food, your servants, and showing off your social position. The people who came to your banquet were a sign of your status. So deciding who to invite could be a complicated process. You could rule out lots of people from the start, like poor people and socially outcast people. People like that are definitely not going to be included. And that goes for anyone who's ritually unclean. You can't have them defiling things for everyone else. But from the people who were left as possible guests, who should we invite? They had to be of high enough standing to make us look good, but not so high that they might refuse. After all, it wasn't just who came to your banquet that communicated social status, but which banquets you chose to attend. So the whole thing was very complicated. So that's why it's a little surprising that there was a man at this banquet who was suffering from a debilitating disease. Verse 2. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. The question is, why is this guy there? Under the normal rules of etiquette and social positioning, he wouldn't be invited to the banquet of a prominent person. He was probably suffering from what used to be called dropsy. That's what you'll see in the King James or some of the older translations. Today, doctors would call it edema, which is defined as swelling caused by excess fluid trapped in the body's tissues. Although edema can affect any part of the body, It occurs most often in the hands, arms, feet, ankles, 
and legs. Many of us may have had our own experiences with edema since it occurs in about 80% of pregnant women. But this man seems to have had an especially bad case of it. Because it created this swelling, which can range over the whole body, it was associated at that time with greed and vice. The idea was that the person must be swollen because they're self-indulgent or gluttonous. Severe edema is actually related to congestive heart failure and kidney and liver problems. But as we've seen before, often when we see someone suffering, our first instinct is to assume they probably deserve it. So, if this man in their eyes was so sinful and unsightly, why was he invited to the banquet? Could there be a hidden reason why someone wanted him there? Well, let's see. Jesus was also invited, and it was the Sabbath. And there's been some controversy in the past about Jesus healing people on the Sabbath. Could it be that this man was invited to sort of set a trap for Jesus, to see what he would do? Now, if they're trying to trick Jesus, to fool him into doing something without knowing what's really going on, we've seen several times that that doesn't work. So if that's what they want, they're going to be disappointed. But if they're wondering which is more important to Jesus, upholding social conventions or relieving suffering... If that's what they want to know, they're in luck, because Jesus will gladly answer that question, and he won't be subtle about it. Instead, Jesus exposes the situation openly for what it is. Verse 3, Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Jesus doesn't seem to have much patience for hidden agendas. It's like he's telling them, look, you want to have this conversation or not? They seem to think that healing on the Sabbath was wrong, that it somehow violated God's law. And yet, if they looked to their own actions, they could see this wasn't really what they believed. Verse 5, then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. The most frustrating thing about Jesus' opponents might be their silence. They won't actually come out and say what their objections are. They question, they accuse, they criticize, they judge, but they won't have an open conversation. This whole section portrays the people who uh, oppose Jesus as silent and inactive. Jesus, on the other hand, is just the opposite. He speaks. He takes a stand openly for what he believes. He acts. He doesn't sit around wondering about the appropriateness of healing. He heals. Real faith isn't about inner dialogues and philosophical positions and stuff like that. Real faith is about taking action to accomplish the clear will of God. God wants to heal brokenness and break down walls and welcome people who have been excluded. God wants to expose deception and tell the truth plainly. God wants to overturn meaningless human hierarchies and create true shared wholeness. Real faith isn't about debating these things, but doing them. Unfortunately, though, it isn't just the opponents of Jesus who are sometimes guilty of debating the problems, but not being part of the solution. One writer put it this way. Verse 6 reminds Luke's readers that there are people like the Pharisees who call upon Jesus, sit in His presence, and listen to His teaching, yet remain silent in the face of his concrete call to discipleship to help a fellow human being in need. Real faith is about taking action to accomplish the clear will of God. Have we made taking action a discipline in our lives? 
If we're just playing things by ear, hoping to respond well in the moment, if a need presents itself, that's almost guaranteed to be a losing strategy. Instead, if we really want to take action to accomplish the clear will of God, we have to make it a discipline. Every week, I participate in this program. Every month, I volunteer or I give to this cause. Taking active roles of service, sharing our resources to further the kingdom of God, those aren't examples of advanced faith. That's basic faith. Entry-level faith. Real faith. Real faith is about taking action to accomplish the clear will of God. And if we want to be effective, we have to turn it into a discipline. It's interesting how Luke seems to be operating on several different levels at once as he shares this story. There are the things that happen on the surface of the story, like Jesus heals and teaches and stuff like that. And then there are ways that Luke weaves together larger themes in how he chooses to write about it. For example, do you remember in the last chapter, Jesus healed a woman, also on the Sabbath, who was crippled? Luke says she was bent over so that she could not straighten up at all. It's almost like she was shrunken. She was compressed. And Jesus helped her expand to her normal size. And then Jesus shared some parables about things that are small becoming large. The mustard seed starts off small, but it grows into a tree large enough for birds to perch in it. A small amount of yeast works through a whole batch of dough until the whole thing expands. And those were illustrations of the kingdom of God. What happens when we make God our king? Some things that are small grow large, like our dependence on God, our trust in God, our obedience to God. Those things will gradually grow so large that they take over our whole life and even affect people around us. Now, here in chapter 14, Luke shows us someone who was swollen to larger than their normal size. First, Jesus heals him, helps him grow smaller, back to his normal size. And then, he teaches us how to recover from being spiritually swollen too large. What is it in our lives that's usually too large, swollen to much larger than it should be? Our self-image. Most of us, even if we don't realize it, have a much higher opinion of ourselves than we should. We are not as important as we think we are. Wherever we might rank ourselves in relation to other people, our real score is actually much lower. Now, if that offends us to hear that, we're probably just the people that Jesus is thinking about in this passage. The more that bothers us, the more we need to hear what Jesus is going to say. He wants to teach us how to be more realistic about where we really stand. So he gives us some advice about how to behave at a banquet. As an example, verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. Now whenever I hear this parable, which is unique to the book of Luke, I'm always reminded of a commercial from the 1980s. One of my favorite commercials, you may have seen it before. So I I found it online, and I decided I'm going to share it with you this morning. But I need to warn you, it is a beer commercial. Now... The point of this is not to advocate beer drinking, and I know some of you don't require any encouragement. The point point is that the character in the commercial does exactly what Jesus says not to do, and the result is exactly what Jesus said that it would be. Does anyone remember Bob Euchre? He was a Major League Baseball player in the 1960s with, at best, a mediocre record. 
His lifetime batting average was 200. He's probably more well known as a sports announcer in real life for the Milwaukee Brewers and in the movie Major League. That's what this picture comes from. But in the 1980s, he starred in a series of Miller Lite commercials sort of spoofing his D-list level celebrity, pretending to be more important than he was. And this one is probably the most classic. You know, one of the best things about being an ex-big leaguer is getting freebies to the game. Call the front office, bingo. And once these fans recognize me, I probably won't even have to pay for my light beer from Miller. Down it! <laughs> I love them. These fans know I drink light because it's less filling and it tastes great. Good seats, huh? You're in the wrong shape, buddy. Come on. Oh, I must be in the front come row. On, come, come, come on. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. Good seats, eh, buddy? He missed the tag! He missed the tag! <laughs> So the front office gave him a free ticket all right, but it was not in the front row. It was all the way in the back. Isn't that a perfect reenactment of Jesus' parable about choosing our seats? If you choose one that's too lofty, you're going to be asked to move to something less distinguished. You're going to get a rude awakening of how important or unimportant you really are. Of course, Jesus' real intention isn't just to teach us about how to have appropriate seating arrangements at a banquet, he wants to teach us about how to approach life. Who is the host who invited us to the banquet? God. It's God's world. How could any of us who merely live in it ever decide what's really important? Who is really important? God will be the one to decide that. So we should never assume that we're more important than we are. In fact, the Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So if we go by what Paul says and what Jesus seems to be teaching in this parable, who is the least important person in any room that I enter? Me. That kind of goes against our culture, though, doesn't it? We're taught to think, no one is better than me. I have a right to stand up for what's truly mine. I should be treated with the respect that I deserve, or whatever. That's very American. It's very human. It's not very Christian. Who do we know who is actually the best most important person who has ever lived. Who actually had the right to demand respect and even worship from the rest of us? And yet, as much as he deserved it, he didn't demand it. Instead, he had exactly the opposite attitude. So as Paul continues in Philippians, he tells us to learn to imitate that person. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What Paul is trying to give us is perspective. The truth is, you're not a big deal, and neither am I. Not in any real sense. Jesus is the big deal. So let's live our lives in a way that will please Him and honor Him. Let's live our lives so that when your host comes, He will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. That's what Jesus was talking about in the last verse of this section when He said, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's pray. 
Lord, so much of what you show us and teach us seems upside down in our way of thinking. It seems like everything around us teaches us to promote ourselves, to stand up for ourselves, to be all about ourselves. And yet you've shown us something different. You've shown us the kind of grace and love and wisdom that leads to humility, that values others above ourselves. In many ways, it's unnatural to who we are to think that way. So we need your grace and your power to do something supernatural. We need your spirit to remake us every day. So we ask for that grace, and we ask it in your name. Amen. Let's go together to the Lord's table. The kingdom of God seems to be filled with mysterious paradoxes. The larger we are, really the smaller we are. The smaller we are, really the larger we are. The higher we are, we're actually low. And if we're really, really low, we're actually high. If we're first, 
we end up last. If we're last, we end up first. The whole thing is confusing. And yet, the more we think about it, and the more we contemplate the life of Jesus, the more we listen to him and watch him, it starts to make perfect sense. This table is a perfect example. When you come to this table, we have to be extremely small. We have to recognize our place of lowliness. We have to be poor in spirit. We can't come to this table thinking, well, yes, I want to participate in the life of Jesus, but I'm going to pay my own way. You know, I don't want any charity. I don't want anything given to me. I'm going to, I'm going to pay my fair share and pull my weight. And da, da, da. It will never work. That's not how this works. I don't want anything if it's got to be a gift. Then you can't have it. This is 100% paid for by Jesus. The only way it can happen is because of who he is. And so if we will not humble ourselves enough to receive that gift, we're going to go without. It's the only way it works. And yet when we become small enough to fit through the narrow gate, we discover that on the other side there is a wideness and a hugeness that would never have been available to us unless we become small. It's much easier to kind of talk about it than it is to do it. But as we come to this table today, let's all, we don't really have to become small. The truth is, we have to just recognize that we are. We have to recognize that we already are impoverished in spirit before the Lord. But blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who realize we have nothing, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So come in all your genuine smallness today and receive the hugeness of God's gift. Let's pray. Lord, we don't have to look very far to recognize evidence of our smallness. So before you, we're not going to try to hide it. We're going to truly be our poor selves coming to you for what only you can give because we trust you and your love to make us truly large. We ask it in your name. Amen. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. After giving thanks, he took the bread he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterwards, he took the cup, he blessed it and he gave it to them saying, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. As oft as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. We have some kind of a strange tradition in my family, mostly my dad and my brothers. My mom would never presume to do this, but if we go into a place or something and, and there's a wait at a restaurant or something and they come back and say, well, there's, there's, there, you have to wait for 30 minutes. We always say, well, did you tell them who you were? <laughs> like we're important, you know. I give up, who are you? Nobody knows who we are. Um, I was telling somebody last week, my dad uh, was at this national conference of which he was the president for traffic safety thing. And uh, it was a banquet a year or two later, and the current president, stood, my dad's name is Mari Dennis, and uh, the current president stood up and said, you know, I think we should recognize someone here tonight who's done so much for our discipline and is so important and has been a president of this organization before, and I would like to recognize my good friend, Murray Davis. You know, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't even know his name, you know. So it's just little reminders all the time that we're not a big deal. 
even if we have titles, even if we have positions, even if we have whatever, in the real scheme of things, humility is knowing who God is and knowing who we are and knowing the difference. Unless our vision is that wide, we're never really going to have a true perspective. So, most of us probably wouldn't go into a banquet and immediately sit down in the head place. You know, that parable is a parable. But how many other ways do we kind of assume more for ourselves than we really deserve. Here's a little clue. The more easily I am at offended, the more easily I'm offended by things that people say to me or do to me, the more pride that I have. It's impossible to offend a truly humble person. If you don't give them what they deserve, they don't think they deserve very much anyway. So, as we come to this time of invitation, do you need to move down a few spots? Don't make somebody else come and do it in front of everybody. It'd be better if we move ourselves down, right? So do we need to be, take ourselves down a few pegs? Are there some things that we're not doing because our pride is keeping us from doing it? Are there some apologies we're not making, some relationships we're not mending because our pride stands in the way? Pride is almost always spiritually destructive. At best, it's neutral, but it's usually destructive. So, I won't give you a separate sermon, but I will say... If there are places that we need to move ourselves down in God's sight so that we can function more like Jesus, let's do it. Think on these things during our time of invitation. And now as we go into a new week, may we willfully take the lowest place and wait for the host to come and move us up. Amen. If you're a member of our church, I would ask you to remain for a short congregational meeting, which will be led by our board chair, Jay Bergen. It's on. (laughs) Good morning. It's good to see everybody in person. Uh, I want to call our congregational meeting to order. Uh, We're meeting this morning because uh, after about 20 years, we've been uh, working this year to uh, redo the bylaws to make them more uh, modern, I guess you would say. And uh, I want to thank Susan Stamper and Danny Amos, Gary Hawley, Chris Cal Morgan, and Kyle Dennis. Uh, They met uh, weekly for several months earlier this year to Uh, put together a new version of the bylaws and then to present them to the board and I also want to thank the board because we had some pretty long meetings for several months uh, as we were discussing those bylaws and uh, asking questions and and making some suggestions um, to improve them and we finally got to the point uh, in uh, July where we felt like we were in a really good place Uh, with the bylaws and the board did approve those uh, which has to happen before we can bring them to you as the congregation uh, to vote on them. So there were two documents uh, that were sent out to the church email list um, for you to take a look at. There's also copies um, in the back 
One is the new version of the bylaws to be approved. Um, and the second was a document called Significant Changes, um, so you could see what's being changed in there. Um, and then um, for voting, uh, because we'll have some folks that will be online, and even if you're here in person, <clears throat> excuse me, if you prefer to vote online, you can do that, but uh, there are also some cards um, that they're handing out if you didn't pick one up. Um, but it's a simple yes or no vote. Um, so if you have any questions regarding the bylaws, uh, Susan is, Stamper is here. She was the chair for the task force that worked on it. Uh, feel free to ask me or reach out during the day. But you can vote either uh, by paper and just leave it on the table in the back, or you can go online. If you go online, just go to FCC Plano and click the drop down for uh, info. And then there is a link there this morning for congregational vote. Yes. Oh. Code. So for anybody code. online, Kyle said there's also the QR code if you want to scan there. So, okay. So uh, we'll make this pretty quick and easy. Um, would anybody like to make a motion to approve the bylaws as submitted to the congregation by the board? Yep. Okay. So Danny Amos is making a motion. Do we have a second to approve? Sorry, Susan, who did you see? Okay. Gary Hawley. In the back so we have a second and a motion if you have any questions uh, we do have to approve these as they're written so uh, we can't line item them it's, it's uh, all or nothing so again you can vote either by the card here or you can go online and vote there uh, we're accepting online votes through 6 p.m. Central Standard Time today for those that may be uh, watching online and needing to vote online um, I want to thank everybody um, for being open to this. Um, I know from being involved in all the discussions that um, the changes that were made are to uh, make things easier for the church to function while at the same time protecting um, the church as well. And I can tell you the board had lots and lots of um, discussion around these. So uh, thank you for uh, being open to this cha these changes and uh, for voting today. And in order to continue to leave this open for others and second service to vote and online, um, I need a motion to suspend the meeting. Craig is motioning to suspend this meeting until second uh, service. And at second service, then I will request for a motion to suspend uh, the closure of the meeting until 6 p.m. so that everybody will have time to vote. Yes, Gary. Oh, you're good. Okay. All right, cool. All right. Suspended. Great. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day.